You're listening to On Shifting Ground from Commonwealth Club World Affairs and KQED. I'm Ray Suarez. The immigration debate has lasted for decades, and for as long as I can remember, it's gone nowhere. When I was a reporter in the 1980s, the conversation was about amnesty, what to do with the millions in the country who came illegally and were determined to stay. But things really heated up in the 90s, when the hunger for labor didn't line up with the supply of workers, and the United States basically had a big, blinking, help-wanted sign seen around the world. Tijuana, Laredo, Brownsville, these are the new border battlegrounds in the modern political landscape. And tens of thousands of migrants, many that claim they're facing extreme violence in their home countries, are the pawns in that game. But there have been periods where the U.S. willingly offered a pathway to citizenship for people in danger, like immigrants living through a genocide. From 1975 to 1979, as many as 3 million were killed by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. So in the early 80s, the United States accepted tens of thousands of Cambodians. Those refugees landed in America searching for safety and hoping to erase the memory of war. Some of those who made it onto American soil, though, were too young to remember the place they left. Our producer, Matteo Schimpf, brings us the story of a man forced to face a home he never knew. It's 5.20 in the morning, and I'm laying in bed, just looking up at the ceiling. Nothing's on the wall. It's been more than a year since Poon first woke up in his new apartment. I can feel the breeze. I can hear the chickens outside. But some days feel just as empty and unfamiliar as the first. Right now I'm making up my bed and I have gray sheets. And I want to change it because gray feels kind of depressing. But for now, that's just what I have. My life is kind of depressing sometimes, just thinking about it. In August 2022, Poon Yu was back in Cambodia for the first time in nearly 50 years. When he stepped off the plane in the country's capital, Phnom Penh, he was accompanied by three ICE agents. They'd made the journey there with him all the way from Los Angeles, where, just 24 hours earlier, he'd been escorted out of a police van in shackles. When I first read about Poon's story in the San Francisco Chronicle, I was like, Oh, I think I've seen this before. Back in 2017, I was living in Mexico City and spending a lot of time in rural parts of the country. If you can think back to that time, you might remember President Trump talking a lot about ratcheting up U.S. immigration enforcement. Part of his administration's strategy was to speed up the deportation process by enlisting local police as enforcers. This meant I ended up talking to a lot of people who had just been deported to their home country. Now, I just put home country in air quotes because, yes, these people were born in Mexico, but they'd spent their entire childhoods and young adult lives in the U.S. They didn't have any family they could just call up when they landed in Mexico. No professional networks. It seemed like, and this has been pretty widely reported, it seemed like half of them didn't even speak the language. The whole thing felt inhumane. Poon reminded me a lot of the people I met in Mexico. And he shared something in common with them. They'd broken the law here in the U.S. We'll get to the specifics of his crime in a few minutes. But what stuck with me since I started reporting this story is that whether you're in this country as an unauthorized immigrant or a legal one, whether you've committed a misdemeanor or a felony, the threat of deportation is always looming. Poon was born in Cambodia in 1975. In April of that year, the Khmer Rouge captured Phnom Penh and began systematically killing Cambodian citizens. His family fled the violence in 1976, when he was just a year old. We fled to Thailand, and we ended up staying in Thailand for four years, awaiting somebody from the U.S. to pick us up and help us out, start a new life. 
After the Vietnam War's disastrous end, the U.S. State Department was totally unprepared for the number of refugees that would arrive here from Southeast Asia. As a result, religious organizations stepped in to help find places for people to stay. Poon and his family, they were some of those people. After four years of waiting in Thailand, they got hooked up with a Mormon family that lived about 40 miles north of Salt Lake City, Utah. They had a big house, and that dude was the first time I experienced snow. I'm like, wow, I'm going to freeze to death. After a few years in Utah, Poon's parents decided to move the family to California. Long Beach, where they eventually ended up, is home to the largest population of Cambodians outside of Cambodia. The move gave his family a chance to reconnect with their roots, really, for the first time since they arrived in the U.S. But life in Long Beach was tough. It felt like it was at least 12 people in the house all the time. At least, like a three-bedroom, people scattered all over. I thought that was normal, though. I didn't know, that was just my upbringing. Despite being around more kids that looked like him, Poon got bullied. He said school was pretty racially segregated, and kids from Black and Latino communities, they were territorial, especially as more students from Southeast Asia started showing up. So at 13, Poon joined his older brother's gang for protection, a group of other Cambodian guys who had his back. But ultimately, it's playing the role of protector that would change his life forever. My nephew was having issues at school. He was saying that he was getting bullied and pushed around and harassed by Hispanic students. This is the exact thing I went through when I was growing up. One day, Poon was picking up his nephew from school when they got jumped by another group of teenagers. There was six of them. They got out the car. I got out the car. and My, my nephew got out the car. And there was a small riot that happened in the parking lot. We left really bruised and battered. Emotionally, it tore me up. I'm like, man, I'm here to protect my nephew. Instead, I allowed this to happen. So I left really, really angry and shocked. And I just started drinking when I got home. He'd been drinking heavily at the time, and his life in general, it was kind of a mess. I feel like in the times that we moved from Cambodia to Utah, Utah, California, I felt like a piece of me was left behind somewhere. I felt like I was a failure. I never found a place where I felt settled in. Each time I figured it out, I had to redo it all over again. Poon was constantly reinventing himself. He'd put on one mask to blend in with his new surroundings and then take it off, swap it out when he landed at his next spot. Behind those masks, he said, was a lot of hurt and shame. He was isolated, didn't know who he was. Poon was tired of trying to escape. First genocide, then bullies, and eventually his own self. So when he and his nephew got jumped in the parking lot, Poon saw an opportunity to finally stand his ground. The next day, Poon borrowed a shotgun from a friend, he had never fired a shotgun before, and went out looking for the kids from the parking lot. He and his nephew drove around the neighborhood until they spotted a group walking home from school. Poon thought he recognized one of the kids from the brawl and told his nephew to slow down the car. Poon aimed out the window and fired into the crowd. It killed one of the kids and injured four others. Poon didn't stick around long. Later that night, he skipped Long Beach and drove to Vegas. That's where he got picked up by the police, brought back to Long Beach, and started his long journey through the criminal justice system. In 1996, and at just 20 years old, Poon was convicted of first-degree murder. When the guilty verdict came, my gut feeling was like, man, I'm going to end up doing a lot of time and possibly never get out. I'm really going to die in prison. At the sentencing hearing a few months later, the judge gave him 35 years to life. My heart just froze and momentarily stopped. I felt like I died inside somehow because I knew that it is a strong chance that I'll never make it home again. 
I felt like that was a death sentence, even though it was a life sentence. Poon's first stop was Salinas Valley State Prison in California. It's about 50 miles inland from Monterey. When I first walked on the yard, I was like, man, not only blown away, but fear set in. Just looking around, and it was barbed wires, and I felt like a small boy. It felt defeating, you know? Because now you're caged in like a fish, in a fishbowl. It's like, what next? The prison is a level four facility. That's the highest level of security in the state. And as a result, it's a pretty rough place. I saw a lot of stabbings. And the funny thing is, is that you have to almost stop yourself from being human. When you see somebody bleeding after they just got stabbed, you just got to almost like look the other way. Because every time you see blood or you see a human being hurting, the human side of me makes me want to care. Like, hey, man, I know this is prison, but man, are you okay? But I can't do that. Poon spent six years at Salinas Valley State Prison. By the time he left, he was only a harder, more insular version of the guy who first walked into that yard. And as for his own crime, there wasn't time for deep thinking or reflection. And Poon said he wasn't really interested in that anyways. He was just trying to figure out how to survive. But then something happened that would change the way Poon saw himself and the crime he committed. So after I left Salinas Valley, I went to a level three yard. And I was in my cell and every night there's mail. Uh, an officer came, slid the mail under my door and I picked it up and read it. And it was a letter from my sister, an older sister, and said, hey, look, we have some news that your sister was murdered. A jealous boyfriend shot her in a parking lot and left her to die. And me just reading that, it just made me feel like somebody had punched me and then I couldn't breathe. And my world just stopped. My whole body kind of went numbed. Who the hell would want to do this to a girl, let alone my sister and my family? I'm sad about her life. I'm sad about what she left behind. I'm sad for my sisters, my other sisters, and my parents. I'm sad for myself, because now for sure I'm never going to see her again. I probably lived like that for a week after hearing that news. And after a week, it dawned on me that this must be how the victim's family must have felt when I took their son away from them. It was pivotal that kind of almost changed my outlook on life, really opened my eyes. It planted a seed of compassion and empathy. I don't want to do this to anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody again. The thought of change presented a big problem for Poon. He didn't actually know who he was. Since the day his family fled Cambodia, he'd been like a chameleon camouflaging himself to hide the trauma of war. It was the only way for him to really blend into harsh new environments. But losing his sister, it forced Poon to take a long, hard look in the mirror. And I don't think he liked what he saw. I still feel like I'm not going home. I still feel like I'm going to die in prison. And now I'm carrying this other weight of what happened to my sister, and it makes me feel like, what else is there in life to look forward to? What can I do to find purpose and meaning again? After six years in Soledad State Prison, that's the name of the Level 3 yard, Poon was transferred to San Quentin. It's a prison just a few miles north of San Francisco. It's notorious for housing some of California's most violent offenders, but also for having one of the state's most innovative rehabilitation programs. 
Poon described it as having this kind of college campus vibe. In the showers, inmates were talking to each other about Socrates. But after more than a decade in some pretty intense prisons, it took time for him to adjust. I was shut down when I first arrived. I didn't want to be there because it was so different from the hardcore life that I lived. Among other things, Poon was skeptical of, and I don't really know how else to say it, he was skeptical of how nice everyone was. When other inmates offered him advice, he'd be like, What are you trying to do? Is this manipulation? I don't have no money. I can't give you shit. And then the older guys would tell him, no. Forget about the level four and level three where you're used to watching your back and worrying about what can kick off at any moment, any time. Focus on yourself. Focus on yourself meaning educate yourself. Find the healing you need to understanding who you are today and what led you here. It's a process that would take Poon years to work through. But he needed to start somewhere. During his first rehabilitation program in San Quentin, memories resurfaced that Poon had tried to bury decades ago. Just really, really talking about my crime the first time. Not understanding the magnitude of what I've done exactly. Understand it and really wanted to heal from all the traumatic events that led up to this. All the way from leaving a country where war happened. What happened to me as a result? What happened at home? Why did I feel connected and loved? Those were painful questions for Poon to grapple with. He was responsible for killing another person. He was also the product of a genocide. Three million dead Cambodians wandering with him through the darkness. From a refugee camp in Thailand to prisons in California. For years, Poon worked hard to keep the ghosts at bay. Being both a victim and a perpetrator, it was messy. Pushing those ghosts out of his mind helped numb him to that reality. But the rehabilitation program changed that. It was liberating, it was confusing, and it also hurts. I now see things like, hey, that was the voice you took on, that was the narrative you took on at that time. Do you really see that as true now? Throughout the rehabilitation process, Poon saw how intergenerational trauma contorted the lives of other refugees like him. Eventually, he'd go on to start a program for other AAPI inmates called Roots. They talk about history and war, but also about what comes next, about how to enter back into society. He worked hard to be a support system for guys who wanted to connect their past to their present. And some other things happened while Poon was at San Quentin. In 2015, he received his associate's degree. It's probably one of my proudest moments. I invited my family, my mom, my dad, hey, I need you guys to come to this graduation. It was the first time Poon had seen his parents in 20 years. There's a piece of joy and sadness. They became elderly in front of my eyes. This is not my parents that I remembered. Reality just hits like, I don't know what's going to happen next. How long do they have left? Like it or not, time keeps moving. You got to move with it or else things are just going to pass by and then you're left with regret. In 2021, Poon came up for a parole board hearing. To be found suitable, he had to convince the board's commissioner that he was remorseful and understood the, quote, nature and magnitude of the offense. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but it's a really hard standard to meet. At the time of his hearing, the COVID-19 pandemic was still raging. So instead of sitting at a table across from the commissioner and the DA, maybe with a few other people in the room, Poon was in a one-on-one -on -one call with the head of parole. It was intimidating. They take a break to deliberate, see what they're going to say. And you also sit down in a different waiting room just to wait on their results. My mind started going, like, man, is this going to happen? Is it not? Did I do enough? Did I see the human in me? What if I do get found suitable? What then? 
For hours, Poon agonized over these questions while the board deliberated his case. So as I'm sitting, waiting for deliberation, they call me back in. And I sit there and wait for them to speak. Usually the DA from your county, a place where you committed an offense, usually they will oppose. And then it goes back to the commissioner for him to say what he feels should happen. And then as he was speaking, 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 and, and I, at this point, I'm most kind of numbed. Can't really absorb exactly all the words he was saying because it sounds kind of good, but we're not 100% sure until it gets to the end. He says, yeah, we find you suitable for parole. If you're imagining what that moment might have felt like for Poon, emotional, liberating, he actually describes it as kind of the opposite. Poon had heard stories of guys breaking down crying when they were set to be released. And for me, I'm like, I couldn't get there. Instead, Poon was sort of in a daze. He still felt a sense of guilt tugging away at his conscience. It also feels in a way, man, if I feel joy, it takes away from the crime I've committed. Here I am given a second chance where a life was lost by my hands and he would never have a second chance. It took 150 days for the release process to play out. After Poon was approved by the parole board, his case went to Governor Gavin Newsom's office for sign-off. The whole time, Poon wondered, when is this going to happen? And some days even, is this going to happen at all? And then, a few days before he was set to be released, Poon got a visit from a U.S. immigration official. An ICE agent comes and calls me out my cell. He goes, hey, you have an ice hold. You're not going to walk out of here. Instead, we will transfer you from here to an ICE facility to fight your deportation case. This is what's happening at the center of Poon's case, what people fighting on his behalf would call double punishment. Shortly after arriving to the U.S. as refugees from Cambodia, his family received their green cards. When Poon turned 18, he became eligible for citizenship. The legal terms here, they can get a bit confusing, but he'd spend enough time in this country as a lawful permanent resident to become a citizen. With so much happening at home, though, that fell down the list of priorities. The neighborhood was violent, food wasn't always on the table, and their house, it was overflowing with people. So by the time his family members started the process to become citizens, Poon was already in prison. His conviction revoked his status as a green card holder. And regardless, there's a law that bans people convicted of any aggravated felony after 1990 from becoming citizens. That, of course, includes first-degree murder. So instead, ICE placed a hold on him. Essentially a bookmark in his immigration case saying if and when you're released from state prison, we'll come find you. Now, that day had come. In the eyes of the law, even after years of rehabilitation and being granted parole, Poon was undeserving of staying in the place he called home. And I left prison again. The numbness never really went away. I felt like I was served another life sentence. In December 2021, ICE agents processed Poon in San Francisco before taking him to an ICE facility in Central California. I'm sitting there wondering my fate, waiting for deportation to happen almost. Like, now what? When I do leave, what happens? I have no ties to a country I was born in. I left when I was one years old and don't speak the language, don't know anybody. His impending deportation, it didn't actually come as a surprise. He'd watched dozens of inmates from places like Guatemala and Honduras go through the same process, released from prison one day and picked up by ICE the next. Regardless, once they ended up in a detention facility, they had to decide whether or not to fight their case. As you might imagine, the lawyer fees to do this can be expensive. 
But more importantly, and hugely important for Poon, was the amount of time it would take. He said he met one guy who spent five years fighting his case from that ICE facility. Playing your case, you have to weigh it out. Like, does it matter when the law is already set in stone? Do you prolong your sentence and your stay if you know you're going to lose the case anyways? Did you ever think you had a shot to beat your deportation case? Um, that's hard to say because I didn't give it the time to fight. I didn't give myself that opportunity. Poon's chances of beating his case, they weren't zero. But they were pretty close. Essentially, there were two options. And they were both long shots. One, a gubernatorial pardon from Governor Newsom. And two, being released back into the U.S. on a technicality. In 2016, the Cambodian government rebuked an existing agreement to accept deportees from U.S. prisons. Their argument, simply, was that it was inhumane. But the Trump administration, it quickly put the kibosh on that. Poon thought that maybe, maybe there was a chance Cambodian officials would take things up with President Biden. Or that COVID would permanently shut down the border. And that ICE would be forced to let him stay in the U.S. At some point, though, Poon needed to decide how long he'd really be willing to wait to find out. I went from one incarceration to another, one stress to another. So it, it came a point in time where I really wanted to see freedom. I had to go to a judge and tell him that, hey, this is my decision. Go ahead and sign my papers. After an excruciating month of going back and forth, Poon signed his own removal papers. That was January 2022. For seven months, Poon sat in that ICE detention facility, which, according to his lawyer, is an unusually long period of time. He was praying that he'd get a pardon from Governor Newsom, or that by some miracle, Cambodia would close off its borders. But at the same time, he knew the clock was ticking. I'm in the ICE detention center on the phone with a friend, and an officer asked me, hey, are you this person. I go, yeah. Once you get off the phone, report to the podium and bag up your belongings. And that's all he said. Oh, my heart just started pounding. I'm like, this is it. This is the moment they're going to take me. So I hung up the phone. I said, hey, let me try to call my lawyer real quick just to give him the heads up of this is what they're asking me to do right now. His lawyer, by the way, her name's So Young Lee. She's with the Asian Law Caucus in California. So Young said that for months she'd been trying to get a hold of Poon's deportation officer to find out when he'd be deported. So I called my lawyer real quick, told him, look, this is what's happening. And I went to the podium, asked him what's going on. So he goes, I don't know. They just informed me to tell you to back up your belongings. His life, the officer told him, would need to fit in a single backpack. And an ICE agent came. And he's the one who said, hey, you're headed to the airport. I was like, damn. They are shipping me now. I couldn't call anybody. On the ride from Central California to LAX, Poon claims he made repeated attempts to call his lawyer back. But he was denied. We reached out to ICE about this, by the way, but didn't hear back before publishing this story. Regardless, there were hundreds of people waiting to hear about what would happen to Poon. Family, colleagues, advocates, politicians. They wanted to know that he was going to be okay. It wasn't until they arrived at the gate that the three officers unshackled him. And they said, hey, our first stop is Singapore. And we're going to go to Cambodia after that. That's where we're going to drop you off. I was like, sir, when can I get my phone call? I'm allowed that. He said, hey, on the next stop, I'll get you. The next stop comes by, I reminded him. He said, yeah, okay, okay, I got you, I got you. And didn't do it. I'm like, man, is this dude playing games with me or he's just really forgetting? Because I wanted to give my lawyer the heads up because she tells everybody else, my family, like what's going on and everything else. I never got my phone call that I asked for until I got off the airplane, got in a van, and went to a Cambodian immigration center. Went over there and got processed and did some fingerprints, 
took a few pictures, and I said, look, man, you're in a new country, you're starting fresh. Just think about it that way. It was starting fresh for Poon. So fresh, in fact, that he had no idea what Phnom Penh even looked like. I thought about Cambodia like, man, I'm going to see cows on a road, dirt roads and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Not knowing that, hey, that was 45 plus years ago. You was one years old. After 30 hours, being taken to LAX in shackles, stopping over in Singapore, getting off a plane in Cambodia, Poon finally got that call with his lawyer and his family. They were relieved to hear from him, of course, but also worried. Poon didn't have a job or speak Khmer, but more immediately, he was living in a sort of legal purgatory. He didn't have a passport, not from the U.S. and not from Cambodia. According to So Young, any documentation of his birth was destroyed in the genocide. He had immigration papers, but no proof that he was actually a citizen of any country. During his first week in Phnom Penh, Poon was alone. In need of company, friendship, and importantly, a Cambodian citizen to back his own application, Poon got a surprising call. My aunt is my mom's youngest sister. It had been nearly 50 years since Poon had seen or spoken to his aunt. She spoke Cambodian and she spoke Thai. Thai was the language that my family used at home. Because we're part Thai, you know? At first it was strange. Because I just landed, I'm thinking, man, I have nobody. But yeah, here's family from decades ago, ready to welcome me and receive me. That felt like no matter what, here's at least somebody that's going to look out for you for the time being. What kind of stuff did you guys talk about? Well, you know, man, at first it was more like family stuff. And then the more I got to talk to them, it feels good. It feels okay to hear stories about them growing up before war before the separation. This is an opportunity for me to piece my life back together. That task, it's a huge mountain for Poon to climb. With the help of his aunt, Poon is now a citizen of Cambodia. But he and his family continue the campaign to bring him home. Poon's parents are now too old to come visit him in Cambodia. He worries he'll never get a chance to see them again. I want to just tell them I am so thankful to be your son, proud as hell. I love you. I hope that you can see that. And I'm damn sorry for everything that I put you through. Just to voice that in person, I think that will alleviate a lot of my burdens I've been carrying for so many years. After spending a few weeks with his aunt out in the Cambodian countryside, Poon got hooked up with his new apartment in Phnom Penh. He's on the third floor, just above a baby supply store with a green awning that stands out against the building's gray exterior. At first, it reminded Poon of prison. He said it felt like a cell without the metal bars and shackles. It's not really that big. I could probably... Just one second. Yeah, I could probably take like nine steps from one end to the other end, and that'll be the length of it. Poon and I have talked for many hours over the course of six months. We became friendly. I know about the motorcycle jacket his brother gave him, and I know the way that powdered milk makes him feel. But there's one thing I still couldn't quite wrap my head around. Why did he sign his own removal papers? Do you regret that at all? (sighs) Parts of me say yes, right? And parts of me says no. I'm trying to go back to the time when I'm sitting there in in ICE detention center and how ready I was to taste freedom. To me, I thought that, hey, freedom is freedom no matter where you're at. And that's the story I told myself while I was there. It wasn't until I actually landed, I'd be like, damn, this is a rude awakening. Looking back, I'm like, huh, should I fought and just give it a try? The truth is, I'm not sure it's clear to him either. But as he watches Phnom Penh wake up from his balcony, people riding their motorcycles, moms and kids walking to school, just life happening, his perspective starts to shift. My situation has changed quite a bit. I've made a mental 
commitment to myself to try my best to detach from the two worlds I was living in. I was stuck. My heart was in the U.S. My family, my friends was in the U.S. I wanted to be home so bad. And now I'm accepting my reality is that you're here now. You have to adjust and start living again. Stop living in two worlds. Poon's lawyer, So Young Lee, says his legal options at this point are limited. The only way for him to reunite with his family is through a pardon by Governor Newsom. So Young is pretty sure the governor has heard of Poon's case, but so far there hasn't been any movement. In the meantime, the Asian Law Caucus is working to pass legislation in California that would prevent local and state police from cooperating with federal immigration authorities. In their eyes, the relationship between local enforcement and ICE undermines California's status as a sanctuary state and can lead to double punishment cases like Poon's. Opposition groups argue the legislation would prevent collaboration between federal and state authorities on anti-human trafficking and terrorist initiatives. The Vision Act, as the bill was called, fell three votes short in California's 2022 state legislative session. But there is new proposed legislation called SEADRA that would limit DHS's ability to carry out deportation activities for Southeast Asian refugees like Poon and provide them a pathway back to the U.S. Regardless, for now, Poon's case remains in limbo. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced, mixed, and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. And I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.